This is a series of lectures on exterior differential systems for students of mathematics. First, let's start with what are exterior differential systems and why do we want to study them? The, the main point of studying exterior differential systems is to be able to check if a system of differential equations has local solutions and to do this using only linear algebra. So we want to test for the existence of local solutions of differential equations. The differential equations we're going to study will be uh, derived from differential geometry. They'll be geometric equations and they'll be described in the language of differential geometry. So we'll have to assume that the, the student listening to these lectures will already have studied manifolds, maps, vector fields, and differential forms in a course of differential geometry. We'll also assume familiarity with, familiarity with the notion of analyticity, by which I mean real analyticity. Um, so we, we, we assume that all the, that the maps, vector fields, and differential forms we're dealing with can be written in convergent Taylor series expansions in local coordinates. We're assuming everything's analytic, the manifolds, the maps, the vector fields, and the differential forms. There'll be a lot of details that we skip over in these lectures and that are dealt with more carefully in the lecture notes, which also have a lot of uh, solved problems in them, with hints, at the, for hints and solutions uh, for the problems in the back of the notes. So our first step is to think about, given a differential equation, how we would rewrite it in terms of a differential geometry, and we'll rewrite it in terms of differential forms. So given a differential equation, can we rewrite it in differential forms? Suppose we take a simple example, like 0 is some function of x, u, and ux, where here ux means the derivative of, of function u with regard to variable x. How can we rewrite that in a more geometric way using differential forms? First, we'll add a variable called p to represent ux. So now we'll have variables x, u, and p, and an equation that requires that 0 is f of x, u, and p. Let's let theta be du minus p dx, and let omega be dx. So we have now differential forms on the, in the variables x, u, and p. In the three-dimensional space, parameterized by x, u, and p variables, we let m be the subset of points at which this little f function is 0. f of x, u, and p vanishes. And we'll assume it's a manifold. This is a technical issue. It may be that the solutions of some equations form something much worse than a manifold but it won't happen in the examples we want to deal with. And it's an issue that's, that's somewhat subtle, so let's uh, try to ignore it for now and think about the case where m is a manifold, which will always happen in the examples we're interested in. So we're, we'll then look at the submanifolds of m on which the form theta vanishes and in which the form omega doesn't vanish. Because omega doesn't vanish, omega is dx, so locally, at least, x can be written as one of a, of a collection of coordinates on the on the sub on the submanifold. And because theta does vanish, p is the derivative of u with regard to that x variable on that submanifold. And so we obtain a solution: um, on the submanifolds of M on which theta is zero and omega is not zero are locally the graphs of solutions of the differential equation, and conversely. The, um, this seems like maybe we've somehow done something magical, we solved a differential equation, but in fact we only, of course, replaced the problem of solving a differential equation with the problem of finding sub-manifolds of a given manifold on which various forms vanish. This generalizes immediately to all sorts of other problems if we have many um, more variables, many more functions, and uh, differential equations of any order, we can easily rewrite them in the same way. So well, we want to think about um, getting forms to vanish on, on submanifolds. An integral manifold of some collection of differential forms is a submanifold on which the forms vanish. So our problem is then given a manifold and um, some differential forms, can we find it's in the integral manifolds of those forms? 
Now, if you have some forms and you want them to vanish on some submanifolds, the submanifolds in which they vanish won't change if you multiply all the forms by 3. They won't change if you add various multiples of those forms to others of those forms and so on. You can throw in multiples of the forms into the collection of forms you already have. So we can replace the differential forms we're, we're studying by the ideal they generate. So an exterior differential system is an ideal of differential forms. But if a form vanishes on a submanifold, then its differential also vanishes, its exterior derivative. And so we can assume that our ideal is differentially closed. If it's not, we can replace it by the ideal which is differentially closed, which it generates. And we can also assume that it's a direct sum of its components in the different degrees, one forms, two forms, and so on. Because if you have a sum of a one form and a two form, and it vanishes on a surface, for example, then the individual one form and two form components al also already vanish. So we may assume that our ideal is a direct sum of forms of one forms, two forms, three forms, and so on. So that's an exterior differential system. It's an ideal of forms which is closed under exterior derivative and is a direct sum of its of its uh, forms in each individual degree. So the problem we're faced with is to find integral manifolds. And we don't have any technique for that. So far we haven't had any idea how we'd actually do that. Um, it turns out in general that's of course too hard a problem to solve. Because the problem of finding integral manifolds, as we've more or less seen, is the same as the problem of solving differential equations. And that's too hard a problem. We can't solve all differential equations. We can hardly solve any of them. So we have to find an easier problem, which we can definitely solve. And since we like linear algebra, and we're going to use it as our main tool, you won't be surprised that the problem we're going to solve instead is a linear algebra problem. Let's see if we can find an easier problem that's part way towards solving for integral manifolds, but that's only going to be given by linear algebra. An integral element is a linear subspace in one tangent space of our manifold on which all of our differential forms vanish. All the differential forms in the exterior differential system should vanish on that linear subspace in that tangent space. Now since that's calculated in one tangent space at one point, uh, it's really a linear algebra problem. There, there are no manifolds involved, there's no differential geometry anymore. And we'll see that we can iteratively, iteratively construct a series of, of, of linear algebra problems uh, so that they will construct for us all these uh, the integral elements. So rather than finding integral manifolds, which is hard, we'll try to find integral elements, which is practically speaking very often not hard. It's usually easier to find the integral elements than it would be to find the integral manifolds because it's linear algebra. Now, on the other hand, what do integral elements have to do with integral manifolds? If we replaced our original problem with an easier problem, how do we get back to the original problem? It's clear that every tangent space of every integral manifold must be an integral element. The differential forms in, in, our, in our system I vanish on all the integral manifolds, and that means precisely that they vanish on each tangent space of all of our integral manifolds. So each tangent space is an integral element. And so naturally, there's a relationship between the problem of finding integral manifolds and that of finding integral elements. Once we find the integral elements, we have to sort of thread them together into manifolds. But some of the integral elements we find may not be tangent to any integral manifold, and that will happen. So there'll be integral elements which don't arise as tangent spaces of integral manifolds, and we want to somehow throw them away. We're really interested in which integral elements we can guarantee somehow occur as tangent spaces of integral manifolds. And that will enable us to, to use linear algebra to understand something about differential equations. We want to go back to the idea of uh, looking at linear algebra to construct integral elements. So for the moment, we set aside integral manifolds and just worry about how do we build integral elements step by step using only linear algebra. Suppose you already had an integral element let's call it capital E, of an exterior differential system I on a manifold M. Take a single integral element and try and make it bigger. How can I figure out what would be a larger integral element that would contain that one? So I'd like to be able to figure out how to find a vector that I could add to E and continue to have an integral element. Let's pick some vectors E1 to EK from capital E. Those vectors 
could be any vectors from capital E. They don't have to be a basis. They don't have to span. They don't have to be linearly independent. They can just be any vectors from E. A polar equation is a linear map given by taking any vector W in the tangent space at our point and mapping it by plugging it in to one of these differential forms, theta, which belongs to our ideal I. We plug it in, and then we still have a bunch of slots left over because the differential form eats many vectors in general, and we fill in the remaining slots with our vectors E1 to EK. So once we have some vectors, we can take any form, in this case of degree k plus 1, and we can plug in uh, a, a vector w into it in the first slot, and then use our constant choice of e's for the remaining slots. Think here of w as the variable. Theta and the e's are fixed, and that gives us a polar equation as a linear map on w. So each polar equation is a, sing is a linear map in a single tangent space, and so it's an element of the cotangent space at that point. Let's think again about this. So we have a polar equation. It's, it's a map which associates to each vector w in a single tangent space an expression theta of w and then e's. These e's are thought of as chosen and fixed and the theta is chosen and we vary the w. Now suppose that all the polar equations vanish on a particular w. So I have found a vector w on which all those expressions vanish. That means that if I take w and any choices of little e's, e1 to ek, from capital E, if I take any choices of those little e's and plug them in with w, they compatibly fit together to make theta vanish, to make, in other words, the all the differential forms theta from the ideal vanish. So polar equations all vanish just when you can throw w into e and the span of the two put together, w together with e, is also an integral element. In particular, if w is not already in e, that would make us a larger integral element. And that's how we can see that the problem of constructing successively larger and larger integral elements is a linear algebra problem. If I have a capital E integral element, and you have a bigger one, capital F, that contains mine, then uh, the polar equations of mine are among those of yours. Why is that? Because we all have the same theta uh, one form, theta differential forms in our, in our uh, system I, but I only get to pick little e1 to little ek from, from my capital E vector space. You get to pick e1 to ek from a much larger space f. And so you have possibly more polar equations, but you certainly have all the ones I have. You have at least as many, maybe more. So capital E inside capital F implies the polar equations of E are among those of F, and they might be all of them, they might be all exactly the same, or there might be even more for F. So larger polar equations, that large, sorry, larger integral elements typically have more polar equations, sometimes have just the same polar equations. And this leads us again to the idea of, of, of successively constructing polar um, of successively constructing integral elements uh, step by step, starting with the zero integral element. We'll refer to this as an integral flag. An integral flag is a nested sequence of linear subspaces, starting with a zero dimensional subspace, then going to an E1, which is one dimensional, E2 is two dimensional, and so on, as far as we can go up to some EP, some P dimensional subspace. So it's a nested sequence of linear subspaces. The dimensions go up 0, 1, 2, and so on, up to some dimension p. The p is a bit subtle here. It may be that at certain points in our manifold, we can construct EPs, these larger integral elements, at that, which are much larger dimensional than at other points. Different points of the same manifold, you may find, have integral elements of different dimensions, maximal integral elements of different dimensions. So the choice of p is a bit tricky here. It's, it may skip and jump from place to place in a, in a, in a discontinuous manner in the manifold. Nevertheless, we'll, uh, we'll uh, suppose that we have a nested sequence starting from, dim also from dimension 0 and then going up one dimension at a time, e1, e2, and so on.
and that'll be what we'll call an integral flag. It doesn't exactly correspond to the use of the word flag that you might find in, in other subjects in mathematics, where flags usually are expected to go all the way up to the dimension of the ambient vector space. Ours stop, our flag stops at some dimension p, and we don't really know in advance what that p is going to be. We define the characters of that flag by having S0 be the dimension of polar equations of E0. And then we want to say that E1 should have a dimension of polar equations which is S1 larger. Because we said that polar equations get larger and larger as the integral elements go get bigger and bigger. And so what we want to do is to make each Sj be the increment in dimensions of polar equations. The dimension of the polar equations of Ej minus those of Ej minus 1. So the the result is that the sum of the of the characters S0 plus S1 plus dot dot dots plus Sj will be the dimension of polar equations of Ej. So those are the characters. They measure how quickly the dimensions of polar equations go up. They don't measure the dimensions of the Ej's. They measure the dimensions of the polar equations of the Ej's and how fast they go up. And we'll be trying to calculate these characters in examples and we'll use them in, a, in a, some mysterious way to figure out whether or not there are any, uh, any integral manifolds. The generic flag has maximal dimensional polar equations. In other words, after I maybe uh, wiggle the, the, the flag, the, an integral flag, a little bit among integral flags, we'd expect that it would have the largest dimensional polar equations that it could have nearby. Why is that? Because each polar equation is a linear equation with some kind of coefficients in it. And as we dis, uh, perturb our integral flag a little bit among integral flags, we expect that those coefficients will possibly get kicked a little bit, but they won't disappear. They won't go to zero if we make only a small perturbation. And so we'd expect in, in general, and of course it's not hard to justify, that, that they should be maximal dimensional. Linear equations with continuously varying coefficients will will uh, retain maximal rank on an open set. The characters of a single integral element, what if I don't give you a flag, what if I just give you one integral element, EP, and you don't know what the E0, E1, and so on are. You don't know the other, the other um, vector spaces in the flag. What, the, what do I mean by the characters of an integral element? I mean those of the generic flag in it. So we somehow have to perturb our flags when we do these calculations. We have to make sure that we're using generic flags, not some special flag. So that's what we mean by characters of an integral element. The characters of an integral flag, we said, were just the increments and dimensions of polar equations. The characters of an integral element are those of its generic flag inside it. Now, out of those characters, we're going to construct a number, which I'll call the predicted dimension. The predicted dimension is just the sum of the dimension of the manifold and the, the uh, sum S1 plus 2S2 plus dot 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 plus KSK, where it's K here is the P that we had before, um, the dimension of the, largest, uh, of the largest integral element in the flag. So that'll be called the predicted dimension. What is it dimension of, though? What is it predicting? We haven't said that, but that was a number that I'll call a predicted dimension. An integral element, a single integral element, EP, is called involutive if all the nearby integral elements together form of, of the same dimension, of course, form a manifold of the predicted dimension. So I'm going to take a p-dimensional integral element called EP, and I'm going to wiggle it around among integral elements nearby. I'm going to look at all the nearby ones to it, and they're also of dimension P, and I'm going to see whether or not they form a manifold, and I'm going to see what the dimension of that manifold is, and then I'm going to ask, is it the predicted dimension? That's what the predicted dimension is supposed to predict. It's supposed to predict how many integral elements there are nearby, roughly speaking. The carton kahler theorem is the main result we want to get at today. We want to think about how do we decide whether or not there are any integral manifolds around. The carton kahler theorem says if you have an involutive integral element, then it's tangent to an integral manifold. So this gives us a condition that allows us to use pure linear algebra to calculate involutivity. It's a calculation about predicted dimension. 
it calculates out using linear algebra and it decides whether or not this is tangent to an integral manifold. Going back over it, what were these definitions? We said that if we had an integral flag, we could calculate polar equations for each element of the flag. Each of those is computed using just linear algebra. The dimensions are these s0, s1, and so on. And we can plug them into this formula for predicted dimension and decide whether or not this thing is involutive. In order to do that, there's one nonlinear thing that isn't quite linear algebra here. We need to decide if nearby integral elements form a manifold of predicted dimension. That'll usually require us to actually write down what all the nearby integral elements are and actually see if they can be somehow parameterized as a manifold. If that happens, we get an involutive integral element, and it's therefore tangent to an integral manifold. And this will prove that integral manifolds exist. It's actually the precise statement of Cartan Kaler allows it to be a little bit stronger than that. It gives us a slightly better result, which we'll see. But uh, for now, that at least tells us that we could use a linear algebra calculation and come up with the existence of an integral manifold. Let's see if we can do all of this in a single example, working out all the details uh, of all the linear algebra. Let's try and find what are called Lagrangian manifolds. Lagrangian manifolds are integral manifolds of this exterior differential system generated by this two-form. It's a two-form dx1, which dy1, plus dot, 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 plus dxn, which dyn. So how many variables are there? There are two n variables. There are n x's and n y's. And those x's and y's together are the coordinates of a manifold. And this i is an ideal of differential forms on that manifold. It's the, the exterior differential system generated by that particular two-form. So all we need to do is to get that two-form to vanish on something, and we'll have an integral manifold. Let's see how we do that, though. Our theory tells us we should look for integral elements. And if we can pick integral elements using, using pure linear algebra in some simple way, we can calculate characters and find out whether or not there are Lagrangian manifolds. That is to say, whether or not there are submanifolds on which this thing vanishes. Maybe we, for a moment we need to think, what kind of dimension should they have, though? We're going to look for n-dimensional submanifolds. Lagrangian manifolds are supposed to be n-dimensional submanifolds. They're integral manifolds of that system. And we'll try to make them be manifolds which are, which are somehow expressed by setting the y's to be functions of the x's for simplicity. So let's take a look. Here's a flag. I start off always for any exterior differential system with E0 being 0. E1 is going to be spanned by del x1, the unit vector in the x1 direction, and so on and so forth, all the way up to En, which has all the unit vectors in all the x directions. How do I find polar equations? We wrote them before as linear equations involving a variable w, but we don't really need to write them that way. It's easier to think of them as one forms or as covectors, elements of the cotangent space. How do we find them? We plug in into the various slots of our differential forms some of the vectors that are spanning our flag. In this case, we'll just take the del x vectors, del x1 and so on, and we'll plug them in into that two form. You can only plug in one of them because you plug in two of them, you get zero. So you plug in one of the dx's. So let's take a look at E1. It's spanned by del x1, the vector field in the x1 direction. If you plug that vector field into the two form that's inside our ideal i, you get dy1. And that's the polar equation. The polar equation dy1 is associated to del x1. You plug del x1 into the two form, you get out dy1. So uh, that's what we call hooking, right, of hooking a vector field into a, into a differential form. When we plug, hook in other possibilities, other del x j's, we get out the associated dy j's. And so you can see that the polar equations all the way up, all the way up to en, en has polar equations of all, all the dy's, dy1, dy2, and so on up to dyn. Remember that we're doing all this in a single tangent space at a single point. I haven't specified what point, any point x, y in our manifold would do. And we'd calculate out that this, at that point, this particular en has these particular polar equations, these dy's. Let's look at the characters now. So what are the characters? The characters 
are the dimensions of the polar equations uh, for S0 and the dimensions, any increments in dimension of polar equations from then on. Okay, so S0 is just the, the dimension of polar equations of E0, which is zero dimensional. After that, we have one more polar equation in the next uh, in, in the next uh, element of the flag. E1 has a one-dimensional space of polar equations, so it's one dimension larger than the previous set of polar equations. At each step, we add a new dy into the in, as a generator in our polar equations, and so we've added one dimension at each step, and so the characters S1, S2, and so on are all one. We can plug that into the formula now for predicted dimension. Our predicted dimension formula is a bit messy. I'm not going to go into it in detail. It's easy to plug the numbers in that we've just generated. I'll leave you to check the details, and you get some simple expression which you can calculate out. So what are the integral elements? And this is a typical uh, situation when we have to try and figure out the integral elements. We need to somehow write out that the, uh, the exterior differential system is going to have integral elements given by setting certain one forms to be multiples of other one forms. So each integral element will occur at a point of our manifold, a point with coordinates x comma y, with various x values and various y values for those variables. But it'll also have to be written as, as, a, as a linear subspace at that tangent space, at that point x, y. And the linear subspaces we're interested in are n-dimensional. The integral element we wrote down, maybe we go back to it, the integral element en, you can see there, has only the del x's in it. It's the span of the various del x's. In particular, it's given by the equation that sets all the del y's to zero because all the y components of all those vectors are zero. So en has equation dy is zero. That means everything near en has an equation dy is something, some multiple of dx, which I've written here as a, as a matrix A. So each dyi is some aij dxj, some multiple of the dxj's. If we write all those in a matrix A, so all the linear subspaces that are near dy is 0 are dy is something times dx. When does that something give us a Lagrangian subspace? When does it give us subspace on which our exterior differential system vanishes? So we look back at that ideal i with its, with its uh, differential form generated by a single two-form. We plug dy is a dx into that expression and calculate, and I won't do it because I'll let you try it, and you find that it becomes an integral element exactly when this a is a symmetric matrix. So what we found is that we have all of the integral elements at every point given by some symmetric matrix. So the integral elements of this system are given by picking a point x, y with various coordinate functions, x values and y values. So there's two n dimensions of those. And then you have to pick a symmetric matrix, an n by n symmetric matrix. And so you can count out how many integral elements there are. They form a manifold of a certain obvious dimension, which we can calculate out. And I won't check, but it is true that the dimension is correctly predicted. The dimension of the space of integral elements is correctly predicted by the formula on the previous slide. So that means that, according to the cartan kahler theorem, Lagrangian manifolds exist. Okay, so we've calculated out that there are Lagrangian manifolds. There's a little bit of a, of a problem here. We haven't actually checked that the flag that we used, the integral flag we used, was actually generic. But I won't worry about that. That's something we'll deal with in a while. So uh, we, we can begin to wonder if we could do a little bit better. I said that Cartan uh, the cartan kahler theorem has some uh, stronger variant that we can make use of. And I won't go into detail in, uh, in, about that at the moment, but I just want to point out that it actually is a little bit better. It depends on some initial data. And so the cartan kahler theorem builds different integral manifolds for different initial data. And again, this is something we'll go into detail with in, at, a, at a later date. Um, but uh, but that's the fundamental idea that it's it somehow constructs all these different integral manifolds as long as you give it different initial data. So you can make sure not only that there are integral manifolds, but that there are actually a lot of them, infinite dimensional families of them typically. And that's um, an important point here. The initial data that you get to pick, 
depends on somehow SL functions of L variables in some local coordinates. Where what's this SL and what is this L? Um, where SL is the last non-zero character. So if you look at the characters, various of them are, are, are various integer values, and then you may have a bunch of them that are zeros at the end. You look at the last one that's not zero, and you can somehow construct an initial value problem which involves SL functions of L variables, all of which give different integral manifolds. And so you get an interdimensional family of integral manifolds. In our example of Lagrangian manifolds, what we find is actually quite amazing that uh, this uh, calculates out that the Lagrangian manifolds depend on one function of n variables. Sn is 1, Sn is the last non-zero character, all the characters are, 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 are non-zero, and then you get uh, Sn functions of n variables. So you actually get an infinite dimensional family of Lagrangian manifolds. Now, for those of you who've seen Lagrangian manifolds before, you might know that there's an easier way to construct such a thing. But that's not really so important here. What, we've, what we can see is that using only linear algebra, we're able to actually calculate this out. And the cartan killer theorem, when stated in its strongest form, will actually give us infinite dimensional families of Lagrangian manifolds. And it can be applied in a much more general circumstance to, so, to solve problems that are, that are much, much harder than this one. So we've succeeded in uh, solving differential equations, in this case very complicated systems of uh, partial differential equations, using only linear algebra to prove that they, the solutions exist. In order to do that, we need to quote this cartan killer theorem, which is a very big theorem. But nevertheless, we'll see how it, how it works, how it constructs these integral manifolds. We'll be able to use it to solve a wide variety of, of interesting differential geometry problems. We'll focus principally on differential geometry problems because they naturally occur in the context of differential forms. And so it'll be very easy for us to set up the problems. And then we'll be able to just calculate out using linear algebra how many local solutions exist.